<laughs> Hello, I'm Meredith Richards. I'm president of the Virginia Rail Policy Institute. Welcome to another in our webinar series on the relationship between freight and passenger rail operations on shared use corridors. I want to thank our executive director, Michael Testerman, for conceiving of this series and engaging some of America's best talent in the rail industry to present different approaches to this issue. Uh, our speaker today is Brian Sullivan, who's a well known, who's well known to many of you as a regular columnist with Trains Magazine and the author of over 60 books on railroads, uh, as well as being a blogger and a, a podcaster for Combox. Uh, Brian spent 20 years traveling and living in Dublin, Ireland, and he is currently the manager of marketing and events for the Conway Scenic Railroad in New Hampshire. Brian is also known for his rail photography, some of which he'll be sharing with us today. I'm really looking forward to that, Brian. Oh, thank you. Brian's topic is how European railroads successfully manage freight and passenger operations on shared use corridors to achieve what American tourists can only experience with envy, trains that are frequent, precisely on time, conveniently scheduled, and will take you just about anywhere you want to go. He will also share his insights gained from many years living and traveling through Europe by rail. Thank you so much for being with us, Brian. We're all really looking forward uh, to what you have to say today. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just so people know, I'm actually at the, I'm at the Conway Scenic Railroad now. Uh, this, is, this is my regular day job in addition to writing for magazines and trains magazine and spe specifically and uh, doing other things. And I'm on a railway car called, the, we call it the Hattie Evans, but the car was originally built for the Norfolk and Western Railroad in 1949 by the Pullman Company and was assigned initially to the Powhatan Arrow, which was a train that served portions of Virginia. So I just thought that might be of interest to some of your viewers since where I am has a Virginia connection. Um, we have decorated the car to reflect its operation here over Crawford Notch in New Hampshire. So it has murals that show the scenery uh, on Crawford Notch. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna touch on some of the key things that, that European railways have work towards and how they've evolved to handle large volumes of passenger and freight traffic. And the way they do things is really pretty different than American railways. And that stems from the way the railroads evolved differently. And before we get into the slides, the, the quick version is American railways starting up in the 1880s started operating longer, heavier and faster trains than they did in Europe for a variety of reasons. And as the price of labor went up, especially sort of after about 1900 and accelerated with World War I, the emphasis had been on ways to maximize the individual productivity of the worker. And that meant bigger, heavier locomotives, longer trains, heavier trains, while minimizing the amount of infrastructure used. And that, that's something that evolved gradually over a century. So where we try to put as much tonnage over a single line as possible, European railways evolved really quite differently. And when you look at some of these pictures, they have multiple track main lines um, with a, an awful lot of uh, infrastructure and uh, track flexibility. So they can do a lot of things that we can't do here now because they have that infrastructure flexibility. The caveat to that is, is they don't run two mile long 15,000 ton freight trains. Um, their freight trains are generally a, a lot more compact they also, their coupling systems are different, which I'll, I'll cover. And in a European freight train is a lot more agile. It's, it can accelerate and decelerate and get into a siding a lot more quickly than most American freight trains can. The, coupler, the coupling system has a minimal amount of slack. And in some cases they use a, a two pipe air brake, which allows you a graduated release. In effect, that gives you a much greater control when decelerating a train and stopping it. So a train can come into a siding very quickly and it again can come out of a siding very quickly, which allows you a very, a much more agile operation than here where it can take considerable time for a two mile long train to go through a slow speed or a restricted speed uh, turnout to get into a siding and then come back out again, a process that can sometimes take more than half an hour. So I guess if you'd like to put the slideshow on, we'll, we'll start in with the main part of the program. And if you want to go to the first couple of slides there. 
So this is a map that I, it's what they call the, it's an open source map that I, I took off the internet. And it just gives you an idea of, of track density. The orange lines are main lines. The red ones show high speed corridors. High speed by a European definition is generally 150 miles an hour or faster. Uh, it's not mutually exclusive, but in many cases, the high speed railways also do not carry freight. Again, that's not mutually exclusive, um, but in, in many cases, that is the case. So that just gives you, that doesn't show every railway. There's, if you uh, that next, go ahead to that next one. This I got off um, the FS, which is the Italian State Railways, had a, a, a publication they came out with about four years ago, talked about their vision. And the colored lines show uh, the, some of the high-speed networks in Europe, the high-speed lines, the true high-speed lines. And that's just, again, to give you a sense of where, some, just to kind of give you a sense of the geography. We're going to look at Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland and the Czech Republic. The, I've kind of focused on those countries to give us um, visions of what you can do. And if we can go to the next slide. The first place I'm gonna look at is uh, just a, a small station uh, in central Austria on the Westbahn. The, the Westbahn or the Western Railway itself as a corridor dates from the 1840s. It was one of the first railways built in Austria um, and has been consistently improved over uh, almost two centuries. It's now a largely quad track and double track line with uh, movements in either direction on either track or any track. Uh, they, in the last 20 years, have added two tracks to most of the route. In some places, it's four tracks altogether. In a lot of places, the, the lines actually take separate alignments. There's the historic alignment, which serves communities along the line. And then there's a, a new low grade line. And again, there's a fair amount of flexibility. They can use the low grade line for freight or express passenger trains, and they can also use the original line for uh, express passenger trains, obviously at a slightly slower speed, local stopping passenger trains, and freight as the controllers of the line see fit. So I spent about an hour and 10 minutes at one interlocking or a place where there's a complete set of crossovers and took pictures of a number of the trains passing just to sort of demonstrate the degree of flexibility that this type of operation has. So if you wanna to go to the next picture. And again, all these pictures over the, these next 18 pictures were all taken from the same railway platform of trains passing. And these were taken about 10 years ago, but it shows the degree of flexibility. And again, if you yeah, just keep moving forward, here's a stopping passenger train. We have here a freight train, you can slow it down a little bit. Um, and then there's a, again, so I'm standing on this platform. Uh, it gives you an idea of the height of the platform, which is something less than ground level and not quite high level. One of the things about European platforms is unlike in America where we have this problem where a lot of the high level platforms will not accommodate full size modern freight cars. For the most part in Europe, uh, the platform height and the platform profile allows the operation of freight or passenger train wherever you need to run them. You can go to the next slide there. So the rail jet is OBB, which is the state railway. The OBB's high speed, medium speed, freight uh, passenger train rather. So they call it the rail jet. The top speed is in the 125 mile an hour range. It is not high speed as on the same level as the French TGV or the German ICE, but it's still very, very fast and provides an excellent service. It provides a greater level of comfort. So there's rail jets coming and going at this station. And obviously they're not stopping. There's a signaling transponder. That's a fixed transponder uh, that works in conjunction with the line side signaling to enforce a, a positive stop in a situation where the locomotive drivers, they would call it, or an engineer fails to slow a train to the proper speed, it will, it will initiate a, a penalty brake application. Uh, here we have two freight trains. One is coming uh, westbound in the distance and the near train is on a crossover going from the new line to the old line. And then another freight train coming through the middle of the interlocking um, again, you can see there's a fair amount of flexibility. The, these crossovers are built for line speed. So the train does not have to slow. A freight train does not have to slow from its operating speed to go through the crossovers. So there, there's no speed restriction going through the crossovers between the two main lines. Uh, a train obviously operating at top speed on the line to the left uh, would have to slow from its top speed to the speed of the crossover, which is probably about 75 miles an hour. One slightly confusing thing is there's a third party or a open access operator known as Westbahn. Westbahn, the operator, 
operates over the historic infrastructure, also known as West Bond. So that, that can be a little bit confusing. When I'm talking about West Bond, I'm talking about the route, not necessarily the, the open access operator. And that's a, a westbound West Bond train on the West Bond. Um, uh, not far behind it was a, a DB, a German Railways uh, ICE train also operating at, at moderately high speed in the 125 mile an hour range. Here we have a pair of eastbound freight trains. On one set of tracks, the eastbound freight train is uh, a carrying sugar beet, and that's the closer one. In the distance is a freight train that's going to be coming to a halt at a signal because there's a westbound train that's going to cross over in front of it. And if you go to the next picture, all I've done is, is turn around. And so there's the sugar beet train meeting another freight train, and then the next sequence will show. Again, there's the two trains passing. And again, you can see that the sugar beet train was going through that crossover. The train on the, the left here is a uh, intermodal timber train using InnoTrans intermodal timber wagons. So they, they can load these wagons either on the train or on a truck and then load the timber from where it's coming from, send it to where it's going, and then a truck can then pick up the container that has an open top. And uh, that's a, a very innovative way of moving uh, timber on Austrian railways. And then we have a, a, a local stopping train. It's a, a, what I call an EMU, an electric MU. So it's a multiple unit. There's no locomotive per se. There's traction motors under the floor of the car and it, it draws its electricity from the overhead catenary. And then the last in the sequence is a third party freight operator carrying swap body truck containers on a, a low profile intermodal train. And again, it's taking that crossover from the older main to the newer main. The next stop on this trip is Cologne, which is one of my favorite places to, to look at things, especially railways. Uh, the population of Cologne is about 1.1 million. It has extremely dense freight and passenger operations, very heavily built infrastructure, and it demonstrates how you can use portions of the infrastructure for both freight and passenger and segregate it where it's appropriate um, for operations. I'm on a a building called the Panorama, which is, it's an office building, but it has a, a basically a viewing deck at the top. And for a very nominal fee, you can view the bridge. This is the primary bridge for passenger trains serving the main railway station in Cologne, the Cologne Hauptbahnhof, which you can see under the dome structure, kind of center top. That's adjacent to what they call the Dom, which is Cologne's cathedral. The cathedral has stood there for approximately 800 years. Um, in the process of trying to bomb the bridge during World War II, unfortunately, um, the bombers badly damaged the cathedral as well, and it's still under reconstruction all these years later. Originally, I believe it was a double track bridge. It's now up to three spans, carrying a total of six tracks. It is one of the busiest bridges in Europe. Parallel to that bridge is another bridge that crosses the Rhine, and you can see there's a freight train crossing it. The bridge going to the main station is primarily a passenger bridge. I'm not aware of any regular freight movements through the Hauptbahnhof. The bridge that you see here carries both freight and passenger trains. And if you look carefully, you can see there's a freight train uh, kind of on the left, or left part of the bridge about to cross the River Rhine. And then looking down, if you, let's see if I can maybe move my, I don't know, can you see my cursor or not? But there you can, you can see the Dom, the cathedral. You can see the main bridge over the river at the top. Um, the area known as Deutz is Cologne Deutz, and that's, there's a, a very intense junction there where several lines come together to get trains in and out of the passenger station. And then towards the bottom of the screen is that bridge where the freight train was. Yeah, he's, that's it right there. And then there's a map that kind of simplifies that in the next slide. And again, there's the orange and red lines and the black lines are heavy rail, the green lines are metro and light rail, and the pink lines are very light rail, I believe. So we're primarily, for this discussion, interested in the heavy rail lines. And it gives you a sense for what the Cologne infrastructure is like, but also shows us a degree of redundancy. There's more than one way to get for between major points, um, which is certainly necessary owing to the volume of freight and passenger traffic through this very important place. And there's a, an even more simplified version of the map. Some of the places that we're going to look at, we're going to look at the Cologne Mesa Deutz, which is kind of central top. We're going to go to Cologne Sud and Cologne West, which are stations on the, the line that makes a ring around Cologne. From the panorama, I'm looking down on the, some of the junctions feeding uh, Cologne Mesa Deutz. 
Um, several lines come together here. This is these lines are not all exclusively passenger at this point. There is a diverting line that actually comes out that they can send freight underneath this junction at. But you see, there's several passenger trains moving at once in this. I wish I had a number of tra how many trains a day come through this junction, but it would be several hundred, if not thousands. It's it's an extremely busy place. Um, there's one of the that's one of the yards for the primarily for the S bahn. The S bahn is a heavy rail. Uh, commuter style suburban service that uses the, the main network. We are going to, unfortunately, this doesn't appear to be sharp, but this is a map that I use as a base map for an article in Trains Magazine to show Cologne's there kind of at top left. If you, I don't know if this, this map appears again later, but there's two lines. There's th actually, there's three lines between Cologne and Frankfurt. There's the left bank line along the Rhine, which was historically the prime passenger route. There's the right bank line along the Rhine, which is just the other side of the river, which historically was primarily the heavy freight route. And then there's a high speed line, which is identified there in red, which is the high speed line for the ICE. Today, freight can use both left and right bank. The right bank is still preferred for most freight movements. There's an intermodal train and the occasional uh, carload train on the left bank, on average, probably a mere twice an hour. I mean, it doesn't see the degree of freight on the, the right bank. From my experience, there's probably about 10 moves an hour for freight over the right bank, five in each direction, plus a, a local stopping passenger train. The left bank, maybe two freights each way an hour and two to three passenger trains an hour at times, and more than that when things get busy. There's also a degree of flexibility where if for some reason there's maintenance going on on one line or if there's congestion or a problem, they can divert traffic from one side of the river to the other. So in effect, between points, you have a, a quad track main line, although there's limited numbers of places to get from one side to the other. We can go to the next slide. Just a brief look at the high speed line, which was constructed about 2000, 2001. Um, this is the primary high speed route between Cologne and Frankfurt and it's used primarily by the ICE. Grades on the line are up to 4%, so it's not really well suited for freight. Uh, the trains have a top speed here of about 175 miles an hour. Normal speed's about 168 miles an hour. This train is traveling at top speed. Um, uh, I made the photo at a 2,000th of a second to freeze the action, and this is out in the country roughly midway between Cologne and Frankfurt. Um, and that's at one of the stations. If you noticed in the previous picture, there's no fencing along the high-speed line. There is, however, a little sign with a man and a slash through it to indicate to anybody that happened to walk along that you should not trespass along the railway. Um, in Germany, that seems to be suitable to keep people off the tracks. Um, the station has moderately high level platforms. The track is in uh, textbook perfect condition. This is Cologne West. And it's a, a location where there's a number of main tracks and it's where traffic is partly separated out depending on which division of the Rhine they're going down, whether they're going down the left bank or the right bank. What we have here is a, an empty, sorry, that's a, a loaded coal train. And there's a, a Mittel Rheinbahn, which is a third party operator that, op, that provides the local passenger service between Cologne, Mainz and Frankfurt. And that's coming into a station stop on the platform in the foreground. I did a program similar to this about 10 years ago, and uh, somebody noticed that there didn't appear to be very many people using the trains. And the problem is one of perception, in that often when we're photographing trains, we try to keep people out of it, especially when there's crowds of people. I would typically go down to the end of the platform to avoid putting them in the picture because it makes it difficult to photograph trains. It's not that we don't want to photograph people, but they have this way of getting in the way, sometimes to the point where you can't see the train at all. You can go to the, the next picture. And so when I was photographing for this particular event, I made sure I photographed people and their bicycle um, getting off the train. And this was uh, at rush hour at, at the Cologne Sud station, which is Cologne South. Uh, here's a freight train that was in one of, it's on one of the, the holding tracks. Um, it's an intermodal train with swap bodies. These are uh, truck bodies that, that are easily put onto flat cars. Um, a very common type of train. And what happens is at Cologne West and Cologne Sud, the trains will queue up um, for their path. Everything is pathed, which means that there's a schedule for which the train must adhere to. And every part of the schedule has been worked out in advance. So a train might come in and it might sit there for 10, 15 or minutes until its path arrives. And then it passenger train typically would go by and then it will follow, it will follow out as per schedule. This was interesting. This is a, a carload 
uh, a carload freight car. It's interesting on a couple of reasons because it, it's a it's a four wheel or a two axle non bogey. It does not have trucks. It is just an old school four axle car, which is still commonly used in much of continental Europe. But what's interesting is that it has the clearances so that it, it can serve the UK, which the UK, England, Scotland, Wales has much tighter um, <laughs> clearances than than the continental system. So this car actually originated in England about four days prior to the taking of this picture. And that was in August of uh, 2015. I did an article for Trains Magazine about three years ago on the Rhine. And it's aimed at people who wanna take a holiday um, in Germany and experience a really impressive railway and beautiful scenery and basically have a nice time. And so this shows passenger trains on both sides of the river. In this particular instance, both trains are moving. I'm standing on the, the left bank, the west side, and the train on the far side is on the right bank, the east side. And uh, the Mittel Rheinbahn provides the local service on the, the left bank. And that's the opening spread to the Romantic Rhine in Trains Magazine. And again, the map, which for reasons I don't quite understand, is kind of soft, but again, it just it shows the two lines and the area circled is sort of where we're focused for the next few pictures. And again, we're at Oberwiesel, which is on the left bank, the west side. And th this is the primary passenger route. And that's a, a German IC train or intercity train. That's Germany has a, about eight different uh, degrees of passenger service. The ICE high speed train is at the top, followed by the Eurocity, the intercity. And then there's a regional express to be a, like a smaller regional express and then local trains. And you kind of work your way down. The lowest would be the S-Bahn, uh, which serves the cities. And in this picture, if you look carefully at the far left, you'll see there's actually a freight train on the far side of the river. It is difficult to convey the, var the variety and the volume of traffic, freight and passenger on these two railway lines. It's just constant. I mean, you rarely go more than five or 10 minutes without something moving on one side of the river or the other. And it tends to be that everything happens at once. So you might find that nothing happens for 10 minutes and then there's four trains moving all at once and nothing hangs around. Uh, trains move along at, at very good speeds. It's not high speed by European standards, but they, they definitely, they don't hang around. One of the things you find in Europe is if the line speed is 80 miles an hour, the trains travel at 80 miles an hour. They very rarely encounter slow orders where they have to slow their speed. So they can make very good time, even with more conservatively Conserve speed made lines. Next, next slide. This is a tunnel south of St. Gore, which is also along the Rhine. And just to show a variety of traffic, this is a sequence of pictures taken over about five minutes. So we have a uh, intercity, moderately high speed train coming with a class 101 electric. It was designed by Adtrans. It's good for 125 miles an hour. Um, on this particular section of line, it's su something substantially less than that, but probably in the vicinity of 80 miles an hour. Not far behind it is Orion Cargo, which is a third party operator. I say third party, I don't like to say private because in a lot of cases, the third party operators, the open access operators might be one of the other national railways. It might be a consortium of national railways. It might be a, a local government that provides passion service or it might indeed be a private company. The other thing that can be a bit confusing is what's written on the locomotive may not have any relevance to whose train it actually is because leasing companies provide locomotives and uh, a lot of times they also, the different companies will lease locomotives to one another depending on demand. And then uh, north, northward uh, Deutsche Bahn uh, freight train with swap bodies also going to the same tunnel. Now we're gonna take a brief look at the east side, the right bank, and again, historically the freight line. Um, throughout most of the day, there's at least an hourly passenger service that it's a local passenger service. It's operated by the local communities along the line. Um, it uses Statler flirt style equipment, which are built in Switzerland, a standard type of equipment. And for the most part is, um, I see there's a comment there, but I can't read it. Anyway, for the most part is a freight line. So like I said, there's an hourly service. <laughs> and then just a bigger version of the same picture. Uh, not far behind that train, we have an empty, I'd call it an empty auto rack train, an auto carrying train. Um, because of the nature of the contracts, you might find loaded trains passing each other and empty trains passing each other because you don't know where they're going from and coming to without a detailed understanding of the schedule. Um, one of the things about most European freight is 
the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. No, that's a bad, bad term. So one of the things about the, the freights is they're largely point to point. So unlike a lot of American freights where they'd be assembled in yards and they may set off and drop off, most freights go from say a port to a terminal facility. So this train, I don't know where it's coming from offhand, but it went from someplace to deliver automobiles and now it's going back to where the automobiles are manufactured. So there's a, a lot less need for marshaling yards, classification yards. Well, there are such facilities, but they're, they're not as important to the day-to-day -day operation for most freight. And not far behind that train is a, a typical intermodal container train. Um, a lot of the trains that use the Rhine come out of one of the North Sea ports, could be Antwerp, Hamburg. Um, it's, it's one of the big ports. Uh, Rotterdam is a, is a big container port. So there's these huge, massive container ports. Um, often you'll, you know, a, a boat will disgorge a lot of containers and you might see four or five trains over the course of an hour, all carrying one similar type of container that likely all originated from one ship. Um, again, there's a variety of different operators on this line. There's DB, which is the, the DB Shanker, which is historically the, the national freight company. Um, now it's, they've separated out the infrastructure. And one of the things I wanted to discuss is that under the EU prerogative, the, the EU uh, required that the, the historic national company that would have run the freight, handle the infrastructure, serve the passenger, it all would have been one company. They, they required a separation between the infrastructure and the operator. And then once that was achieved, the different railways are required to open up their lines to third party or open access operators. The logistics vary greatly from country to country. Some countries such as Germany, Czech Republic, Poland have been extremely well organized in opening up to operators other than the original national company. Um, other countries haven't done as good a job as that. And again, same basic location uh, further down. This is a Belgian train that probably originated at Antwerp. One thing that's interesting to discuss, it's a concept called the tram train, a tram being like a streetcar. Karl's rule in Germany originated the concept where they allowed their trams from the city, certain types of city trams can use the national network to allow for a much greater uh, reach for the tram. So a tram will come off the street, get on you know, the same track that's used by freight passenger trains and serve communities well beyond what was normally possible with the historic tram network. The tram trains generally are, the, the trams themselves are more heavily built than a typical street tram, but they're more lightly built than a commuter train. What's also, a, yeah, what's also interesting here is the type of signaling. This is not particularly sophisticated signaling. As you can see, there's mechanical semaphores, um, which are probably locally operated from a, a control station in the, in the, in the station. Uh, most of the signals are actually actu actuated by wire. So there's just physically, it's mechanical. There's no electricity involved. Um, yet this line is an extremely busy line with a, a high degree of freight passenger and tram train service on it. And here's a freight train running right alongside a tram train going in the opposite direction. Um, in this particular circumstance, the platform to get on a passenger train adjacent to the freight train is very narrow. So they have a control, which you can see there, it's in the form of a gate. Um, I'm not very fluent in German and I was standing where I wasn't supposed to be and a voice came over a loudspeaker uh, frantically instructing me to get off the platform and get back on the main platform because they only open the gate when you're supposed to board a train. You learn these things one at a time. Not far from that location is Rastat, which is a, a very heavily used line where several different routes south of Karlsruhe all come together. This is all part of the Rhine network. It is a bottleneck. Um, and the bottleneck when I was there was this bridge where just about everything funneled down to two tracks. Um, they have been reworking the, the network here to allow for a, a bypass line so there'll be more capacity. Because this was a bottleneck, a lot of freights would queue up here to wait for a path to go across this bridge. And then the line fans into a, a four track main line. And there's a map that companies that rest at is south, south of Karlsruhe, south, Karlsruhe is south of Frankfurt. This is in sort of Western central Germany. 
Um, you can see there's a dotted line um, going from one of the red lines. That's the, the new bypass that will, will get around that bottleneck at, at Rastat. Um, I've made several trips to Rastat to, to photograph uh, the trains. There's also a very nice castle here in, in case you're interested. There's a sequence of photographs to show the different types of traffic through Rastat. Again, what's interesting is it's used by uh, the tram train. It's used by a variety of freight trains. It is used by local long distance and high speed trains, both from the German operator and from the, the French TGV network. Here we have a, a regional express running alongside one of the tram trains, uh, making pa both making passenger stops at Rastat. <laughs> and a high speed train in the form of a, a TGV duplex, a double deck TGV. Uh, the TGV comes over from Strasbourg and connects to cities in Germany. Um, and then the, the tram train serves the Carl's Rule uh, regional area. And the ICE, which of course is Germany's high speed train and a, a swap body freight. All the photos in this particular sequence were made in, in one afternoon. And again, just to show different forms of freight and coupling, in the foreground, we have an intermodal train where there's a, it's an articulated set. Um, the tank train in the distance, the chemical train, uses a more traditional form of European coupling with buffers and a, a tight lock, it'd be like a screw coupling. It's not like the American knuckle coupler. And in both cases, there's virtually no slack, so it allows for a more efficient operation. Efficiency in that you can accelerate and decelerate quicker. If you want to separate the cars, it's more complicated. Now we're south of Rastat, south of Baden-Baden. This is along the quad track line that's part of the Rhine corridor that connects the Frankfurt area and Switzerland. Extremely busy line, both for freight, passenger, and for these tram trains. Um, this focuses most of the Rhine traffic south of, south of the Rastatt area towards Switzerland. And uh, I'm looking in both directions, but the tram train is northbound. I'm going to go in a way view of the same, and you can see there's, there's two sets of tracks here which are used very flexibly. And not far behind the tram train, there's an intermodal train with swap bodies, and again, and a, another train, both, both operated by DB Shanker. And a uh, open access operator also carrying intermodal southbound and another intermodal operator on the other pair of tracks also southbound. And a regional train with the engine at the back. Uh, it's quite common in Germany for there to be push-pull sets. Um, the engine might be at the back or they might put two push-pull sets together with the two engines facing each other or at opposite ends of the train. And at the far end is a control cab, which is a very standard way of operating. We'll take a, a brief look at Swiss, the Swiss Gotthard route. In 2016, they completed a very long, it's roughly a 35 mile base tunnel, which is shown there in red, that augments the historic eight mile tunnel that was opened in the 1880s at the top of the pass. Both lines remain open. Most through traffic now uses the, the base tunnel at the bottom. Um, there's maybe an hour, uh, hourly passenger service that goes over the top and the occasional freight, uh, hazardous materials and things like that wouldn't be allowed through the big tunnel. And there's a, a close-up view of that map. And there's the route of the Gothard Pass. The, this shows more or less the, uh, the passenger service. So that the, there's a half hourly through passenger service on the red line and an hourly service on the thinner lines to give you an idea of the, the passenger density. Um, as far as freight trains go, before they opened the base tunnel, there was about 120 freight trains a day through the old, over the old route, which is the line that kind of to the left there, the Erstfeld that wound over the top of the mountain. And there's a, a typical Swiss carload train descending the Gotthard Pass at Erstfeld. And uh, just a sequence of photos to show how freight and passenger would operate side by side. And in addition to that, there's a, there's a, you can see there's a crossover right in the middle of everything. And so the freight train is actually, I believe, pushing away from us or no, sorry, the freight train, I believe. Yeah, the freight train is going away from us. So there's engines at the back and the passenger train should be coming towards us. And then this was from, there's a information center at the base of the Gothard Pass. And this is uh, basically sort of describing how the Wi-Fi works within the tunnel. 
And that's a, an Italian State Railways FS, uh, Train Italia Pendolino that was passing the information center at Hersfeld. And uh, this shows the, the old line and the new line. The new line towards the bottom of the image, bottom of the map is the pink line. The old line is the yellow line. Um, so we're gonna visit, we visited Ersfeld. We're now gonna go up to Fluellen and uh, to Arth Goldau, which is just to the north. And again, you can see how the line is on different alignments as well. Arth Goldau is in the center. Of, that's where several different lines come together. Uh, and the, the next picture is of a, a Pendolino. So there's again, one of these Italian state railway Pendolinos. The uh, Pendolino de design was in, invented by Fiat. And it's a tilting train, so it's a it's a pendular it's a it's a passive um, pendular tilting train, which are very common, various styles of the front end. But the the concept of the pendolino is quite common in a number of countries across Europe, and they're particularly valuable on lines where there's a lot of curvature, where true high speed really isn't practical. But by using a, a tilting technology, you can run passenger trains quicker without um, sacrificing uh, customer comfort. And there's a very similar train that one's operated by SBB, the Swiss Federal Railway, uh, again, also on the Gothard route, and that is at Fluellen. And not far behind the Pendolino is a, a Swiss northbound freight train also at Fluellen. This was a map that I, I, I lifted off of the open access, uh, open street rail map, and the colors delineate the maximum speed of the different lines just to give you an idea of what the speeds are. So a, a lot of the lines are sort of in the, between 120 uh, kilometers an hour and 180 kilometers an hour speed range. The red lines are the high speed lines. And the yellow lines are sort of you know, moderate speed in the you know, 100, 150 mile an hour range. Sweden is not as densely populated, um, certainly as Germany but has an excellent railway network. Um, the lines around Stockholm serve both as a commuter railway, a long distance passenger railway, and a moderately, a moderately heavy freight railway. Um, again, there's both the, 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 national op the traditional national operator of Swedish railways. In this case, it's a, it's a third party operator that goes by the trade name Green Cargo. And uh, it's an intermodal train that's coming into a suburban station south of Stockholm. And if you look carefully, you can see there's Belize's, as they call them, the signaling transponders. The yellow panels kind of at the bottom there on the left, um, those are, they provide fixed information that can be sensed by the train and are usually installed in conjunction with uh, a signal where you need to make an absolute stop. Um, what signaling is more complicated than I can get into, but uh, control signal, you'd need to make an absolute stop. And in most intermediate signals, you need to be able to continue past the signal, and that's a, a difference. So in this particular case, the signal shown is a, is a controlled signal where you need to make an absolute stop. Here we have that same intermodal train uh, meeting a northward commuter train for the Stockholm suburban network. The, the freight train is actually going in, it's coming to a stop to allow something to get around it. But if you continue, there's a X2000 is the Swedish high-speed train, um, which can travel at a top speed of about 125 miles an hour. Um, Amtrak briefly brought one of these trains over in the 1990s as a prelude to what became the Acela. And there's that same freight train um, waiting for its time as a series of commuter trains and other trains get around it. Behind this freight train was another private, a different private operator, which was moving just a handful of intermodal wagons uh, to probably to a depot either for repair or for reloading. Next slide. Oh, again, that's the same intermodal train. Just to give you an idea of some of the different types of freight cars themselves. And again, these are, are four wheel cars, which are still quite common in Sweden. And there's that other train. It's a very short freight. It's probably just moving, like I said, there's two flat cars, probably moving them from a wagon works or a freight car shop to where they'll be loaded. Now we're about 12 hours to the north at a place called Lulia. And I apologize if I'm not pronouncing some of these names correctly. I'm not fluent in Swedish. Uh, this is where several sleeping car trains 
uh, terminate and originate uh, to Stockholm. And this is a, a train that's getting ready to leave Lulia to head to Stockholm overnight. And again, I, I put this one in so you can see the type of platform used at a relatively small station. Uh, Lulia is at the top of the Sea of Bothnia, which is the sea that separates Finland and Sweden. And this is a fairly heavy freight terminal as well. Ore trains come down from Narvik, or sorry, they come down from mines between Narvik and this point. Uh, there's a very, very heavy ore service that serves both the port of Narvik and the port of Lulia from these mines in central Sweden, central northern Sweden. This is one of the empty ore trains coming out of the port. The locomotives are called IORE and they were built by Alstom. They're extremely powerful. I believe at the time they were constructed, they were the most powerful locomotives in the world, overhead electric, and they're carrying uh, custom designed South African built wagons uh, specifically to move iron ore from these mines. This is one of the iron ore wagons or freight cars, if you like. They're by European standards, very high capacity. Um, you notice a couple of things is they have a drawbar connection on the right, meaning there's no coupler. The coupling device is strictly a drawbar. There's no way to disconnect it easily without bringing it to the shop. On the left is a knuckle coupler of the Janney design, similar to what we would use in the United States, although not precisely. Equally significant is you can see that it has two pipe air brake, which again allows you graduated release, which is a great advantage when moving very heavy trains. These ore trains are in the vicinity of about uh, 7,500 tons, which would make them amongst the heaviest trains in Europe. And again, you can see the ore train going out. There's a, a locomotive that's getting ready to, to couple onto a, again, a little one of these overnight sleepers that will head down to Stockholm. And the ore trains and the passenger trains use the same set of tracks in and out of Lulia. Next stop is the Czech Republic which has a very, very heavily built railway network. In addition to very impressive main lines, they have an incredible branch line network that serves just about every moderate sized community across the Czech Republic. Um, and this is at the main station in Prague. There's no freight service through the main station in Prague, but once you leave the main station, there's a, a, a quad or sorry, a triple track line that goes to the east that handles both freight and passenger traffic. That's also paralleled by a secondary line for about 30 miles that handles freight coming down from Germany as well as some passenger traffic. That's a, a moderately sized station in a moderately sized community about half an hour from Prague. Um, Czech, rider, Czech, Czech passion trains have very good ridership and like I said, all across the Czech Republic are you know, passenger stations of various sizes and they, they run a very good service. I mean, some of the equipment is a bit antique, but the track is in just immaculate condition. This would be an open access operator carrying a chemical train. It could be oil, it could be some sort of petrochemical, it could be something else. I don't know what was in it, but the, the tank cars themselves are owned by GATX, a general American tank. Um, the locomotive is an antique that the uh, company itself has decorated quite colorfully. This is on the secondary line that runs parallel to the main line via Prague. Um, there's an hourly passenger service here, plus a continual parade of freight trains of all variety. About an hour and a half from Prague on the triple track main line to the east. Again, an extremely busy line. In addition to a great variety of freight operated both by the the, the traditional national operated CD. Um, there's also, or Chesky Drahi, again, I apologize for my pronunciation. That's the traditional national company. Um, there's also a great variety of uh, open access freight operators. You have Chesky Drahi passenger services that come in about four varieties of speed. You have a super city, a Euro city, an intercity, and then stopping passenger trains. And then you also have two open access passenger operators, you have Leo and the Regio jet. So there's an incredible variety of trains all using the same main line. In addition to the three main tracks, most stations would have a north and a south siding. The sidings can be entered at probably about 30 miles an hour to allow you to get a full train into the siding quickly. And you'll see some operation of that in the coming slides. So we're gonna go to Olomuc, which is Olmutz. It's the historic capital of Moravia. Uh, the Czech Republic is comprised of Bohemia, which is Prague and environs, and Olomuc and environs, which is Moravia. We're gonna go, if you follow that straight orange line down to a place that's spelled Grigov, I 
don't vouch for the pronunciation. This is a small station about 15 minutes from Olomuc on the busy three track main line that goes to the east. The line splits at Prera with one line going down to uh, towards Vienna and the other line going uh, up towards Ostrava, Poland and Slovakia. There's an incredible volume of passenger service. Again, all the passenger trains I just described, local passenger trains such as you see here, plus a variety of, of inner city and Euro city and super city trains. The two trains you see are on main lines. The track in the immediate foreground is a, is a passing siding that can be used by local passenger trains or by freight. Here we have a, another one of these open access freight operators with a, what they call a serial train, a grain train. I've now crossed over to the other side. Uh, we have a cement train that's come into the passing siding. And if you look very carefully, you'll see off in this distance, there's the following passenger train. And this is a very common pattern. So the cement train would, be, uh, would not be able to operate at maximum speed. So every so often it would be paths to get out of the way of a scheduled passenger train. Next slide. So the cement train has come in. This is the Regiojet open access passenger operator. Blitz is past it. Top speed on this line is in the vicinity of 90 miles an hour. Once the passenger train is cleared, the, the cement train will get a signal to go and continue on its journey. Just to give you the, what, this is a, the inside of a, a standard class uh, intercity passenger train uh, that was going from, uh, I believe, Warsaw and Poland to Vienna. It was actually a Polish train traveling uh, on Czech rails. Again, the Regio jet with a modern Vectron style electric the Vectron is the same basic model that Amtrak uses for its uh, ACS-64 uh, city sprinter, they call them. It's a Siemens-built Siemens designed electric locomotive, very standard type, very good locomotive. And this is at a, a rural station on that three track uh, main line. In the foreground is one of these uh, passing sidings. So we've got a wet, an eastward passenger train immediately followed by an eastward carload freight and again, you can see that there's a variety of tracks. You've got your three main tracks, which are the three center tracks, plus a north and a south passing siding, which gives the railway an incredible amount of flexibility to handle an incredible volume of traffic. At one point on this line back in 2008, I counted something like 11 to 14 moves in each direction over the railway in an hour. So almost 30 trains in an hour over, over this railway. This demonstrates the Pendolino in its tilting capacity. So here we have a super city Pendolino heading towards Prague. Not far behind it in the next slide. This is a Slovakian a Euro City Express train that was again heading towards Prague. And then behind that, yet again, we have a, a cement train. And a, a common type of cement car there. And again, one of the things to point out is I, I'd like you to pay attention. Don't, don't mind the grass growing. That doesn't affect anything. But the, the quality of the infrastructure is incredible. Very heavy ballast, very, very well built track. One of the things that you rarely see in Europe is track maintenance. Um, I've just been informed that my internet connection is unstable. So if this breaks up a little bit, I apologize. We're going to take a, a look at Finland, which is another incredible place to, to just experience and has a very interesting railway, which on many levels is probably more applicable to the American situation that Finland has got a fairly low, low density population is what I'm looking for. And a lot of their lines are single track versus multiple track, yet they still make very good use of using their lines for carrying freight and passenger traffic. And this photograph is taken at midnight and Olu. Olu is by, by rail about eight hours north of Helsinki, um, and it's, it's on the, the Bothnian Sea. It's a, a moderate-sized community, um, very dense population within it, very rural without it. It's a location of shops, a fairly sizable freight classification yard, and an important rail station in a junction between several different routes. And again, a photograph at midnight. In July, it never gets completely dark in Olu. You're, south of the Arctic Circle, but not by much. So one of the things that's interesting about Finland is the way they handle their freight and passenger. While they do run freight all day and they do run passenger all day, passenger operations are sort of concentrated during daytime hours. 
and freight is concentrated in the, the wee hours of the morning. So when the system has fewer passenger trains, it has a lot more freight. So in the summer months, you can see the freight moving with at least some twilight. You can go to the next slide. This is in the yards at Olu, passenger car stored at the left, freight yard at the right, and we have an empty timber train entering the yard. Some of the lines are electrified. <laughs> some of the lines are not. So you'll find diesels under, operating under wire. Uh, they've had a very aggressive plan to electrify most of the network. And when I was there in 2015, lines that had previously been all diesel had been fully electrified and with greater progress anticipated. What we're looking at is the VR Group's modern uh, passenger train servicing center. It's a locomotive and passenger car servicing center. Very, very modern. We have a tour of it and there's a few pictures inside later in the program. At left is an empty timber train leaving, leaving the yards at Olu in the late hours of the evening. And it's going out to the central portion of the country where during the daylight hours, it will be loaded and then it will return laden back to Olu for continued transport. So here we have, we're at Kontiomaki, which is in sort of north central Finland, roughly halfway between Olu and the Russian frontier. And they are loading a timber train similar to the one that I had pictured. We can go to the next picture. Not far from Kontiomaki, we have a pair of Russian built electrics for the VR, the Finnish railways, heading back towards Olu with a fully laden timber train. There's an awful lot of timber moved by rail in Finland because there's an awful lot of trees. This is on a freight only line that connects uh, Kontiomaki with the Russian border. And these are Russian diesels with uh, Russian ore wagons or comes over from Russia, crosses the frontier between the two countries. The train is deposited in a yard. They change engines. A uh, set of Finnish electrics takes the ore and then brings it to a steel mill uh, along the Bothnian Sea south of Olu. And I'm standing at the edge of the border zone. I described this in a Trains Magazine article, but there's a, an area maybe two or three miles wide that separates Finland from Russia. And I'm on the Finnish side of the Finnish border zone. And you're not allowed to enter the border zone without permission. Um, it's unwritten, but I think there's probably really good safety reasons that you would not want to cross the border zone. They've had incidents. Uh, one occurred about 1940 where the, the Russians uh, penetrated the border zone much to their consternation. Anyway, here we have a, a dragging equipment hotbox detector. Um, this is on the, the heavily built ore railway, about midway between the Russian border and Kontiomaki. And here we have a loaded ore train going over the hotbox detector. And I like to include, I like to include some of these pictures just to give you a sense for what sort of infrastructure and what it looks like. And again, this, this railway is relatively modern. I don't know the exact date, but I'm guessing it was probably built maybe 40 years ago. In, in the bigger picture of Finnish railways, it's relatively new. And the, the freight cars themselves are, are Russian built. Um, the Russian railways use a much heavier standard for freight equipment than most of continental Europe. Because the Russian trains come across the border at unpredictable times, and the Finnish railway is very carefully planned, what they do is they, they bring the ore trains to a point near Kontiomaki where they wait, they often change crews, and this train has a set path. It might sit here for two or three hours until its path is reached. If there's no ore train, they don't run one. If there's an ore train, it enters the system at a very specific time so it doesn't interfere the regularly scheduled trains that operate on a, a fixed timetable. In this way, the Finns can regulate when the ore arrives and they don't have situations where all of a sudden there's an ore train in the middle of everything disrupting their single track railway. Here's inside the Olu passenger facility. This is where they maintain their passenger cars. Um, again, as a maintenance facility, it is one of the cleanest I've ever seen. The facility at the time I was photographing, it was nearly brand new. It was augmenting and ultimately replacing an older facility. Um, we were brought around by representatives of the Finnish railways. Um, I was asked specifically not to photograph people. The concern was is they didn't want me to photograph uh, working practices. That was their request, so I didn't do it. 
I did photograph the equipment, however. That's the outside of the facility. Um, they were very, very proud of this, and it's a truly an immaculate facility. It, just everything about it was, you know, right out of a IKEA box. It was very, very well done. Finland, like a lot of countries in Europe, has bought the Fiat-style Pendolinos. Uh, here's the Pendolino train heading towards uh, Olu from Helsinki, and it's coming through the north end of the yard at Olu. And inside the Pendolino, personally, I'm not a big fan of the Pendolino in that it's like flying on rails. The seats are smaller. There's less room. Um, it is true the Pendolino will get you where you're going faster, but in most cases, I'm not that much of a hurry. However, that said, the Pendolino is generally a very popular train amongst riders. This is inside the control center at Olu. Um, this is effectively their dispatching center, and it gives you a sense of the modern facility. Each dispatcher would have a set territory, and they can line signals and switches, um, and they can control movements over the network. And if you look at top left, you'll notice there's a, a traffic diagram that shows where the trains are supposed to meet. And that takes a little bit of getting used to, but this is how they will know where the different trains will, will meet each other on, on single track lines. There are three sleeping car trains in season that go south from Olu that come, they originate at various different points. Um, I was about to board that one and it would take me down overnight to Helsinki. Uh, unfortunately, it was pouring rain at the time, which makes for an atmospheric picture, but doesn't do much for the photographic equipment. Now we're at the Helsinki main station. Um, the train we're looking at is the Leo Tolstoy, which is a overnight sleeper that connects Helsinki with Moscow. Uh, there's also three or four times a day, there's an Allegro, which is a special Pendolino, unfortunately not pictured, that connects um, Helsinki with, directly with St. Petersburg. The Russians and the Finns have an arrangement where it's not very difficult for them to travel between those cities. Um, for an American to travel from Helsinki to St. Petersburg requires substantially more bureaucracy. And again, there's the arriving Leo Tolstoy at a Helsinki suburban station. Um, the, this railroad effectively had eight tracks at this particular point, um, a very busy place. There's a very intensively operated uh, suburban rail network serving Helsinki, in addition to the long distance passenger trains such as this one and a, a variety of freight trains. And there's that Leo Tolstoy with the Russian built Russian carriages or passenger cars, if you like, passing. One of the newest services in Helsinki when I visited was there was a, a heart shaped in the form of a route map the route map was a heart-shaped service to uh, the Hel Helsinki airport, which had began service about two weeks before I got there. This would have been in the summer of 2015. And that's one of the Statler flirts that's approaching to bring people to the airport. And we're at a, a suburban station about 20 minutes out of downtown Helsinki. And again, on brand new railway, passenger only, but this is the airport train on the brand new railway. They serve this heart-shaped route in both directions. So there are two effectively two routes from Helsinki to the airport. So they can serve basically connected two suburban lines. So they provide a suburban service and an airport service with the same train. And I believe that's just about the end of the program. Again, we go back to the, the, the big map of Europe so you can kind of get a sense for where things are. This not only shows Europe, but Central Asia and Japan, China, Korea, India, et cetera. And that's the, the gist of the program. And again, I wanted to give people a sense for the different types of infrastructure, the different types of service, the fact that a lot of, in a lot of cases, the freight trains are much shorter. Usually 35 or 40 freight cars is about all you would normally get on most of the, of the freight network in Europe. There are exceptions, but they, they're the exception to the rule. Um, that said, the freight trains are a lot more frequent. They are more agile in that they can accelerate and decelerate more quickly because of the changes in technology. Um, they, as you saw, largely the, the network is electrified. There's exceptions to that, but most of the main lines in Europe would be one form of electrification or another. Um, everything is heavily signaled. Um, the signaling in a lot of cases is not all that complicated, but it does, it does work. Um, we use a portion of the ETRMS style signaling is, is the route to Amtrak's access signaling, which is what's in place from Boston, 
most of the way to Washington. There's exceptions to that again. One of the, the difficulty things about railways is whatever you say, there's always an exception too. So I, I try to speak in, in generalities and someone will say, well, but, but, but in this particular place, it's different. Well, now that is true. Um, anyway, so I guess that's the, the gist of the main part of the program. I tried to cover a lot without getting into excessive amounts of detail. One of the things that's a bit complicated is every aspect of a railway interfaces with every other aspect, often in ways that we don't predict. I work at a very small railway here in New Hampshire. It blew my mind how complicated a railway as simple as a tourist railway is. Every aspect it affects everything else. So if you change one thing, there'll be a whole series of knock-on effects, which can make implementing big changes extremely problematic. Um, if you change something, even for the better, you might find that it interferes with something in a way that you hadn't expected. Um, I guess I can answer a question if there are any, or I'm not really sure how you want to go from there. Uh, Meredith and Michael, I think uh, Michael has a couple questions yeah. uh, for you. Yeah. Hi, Brian. I do have a more than a couple questions. Uh, we'll see how fast we can go. Um, okay. I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. I again, I I don't have my entire library with me, so I can only I can only do my best. So, uh, Bill Ingram, who's a, a BRPI director uh, sent this by email. Uh, he wants to know approximate market share of freight and passenger that are uh, on these routes in Europe. Um, does it? It, it us varies greatly. I don't have figures for Germany. Uh, I looked at the figures for the Italian railways, and if you, if I can do this without disconnecting us, I think I actually have. Italy is not great, and they're looking to improve it. Let me see if I can find that. Um, I cannot, but it's, it's actually, it's not as good as you might think. Now in Germany, it's very good. In Germany, the last time I checked and the figures are probably three or four years old, they carry more than a billion passengers a year. If you compare that to Amtrak's, what, 300, or sorry, 35 to 40 million, um, you know, it, it's, a very heavily used system. As far as freight, it's not, they don't carry the same rate that we do in this country. And what makes comparison very difficult is we calculate ton miles, which doesn't really tell you much if you're carrying intermodal traffic. Uh, it can tell you a lot if you're moving iron ore. Um, unfortunately, just giving a high ton mile figure, while it looks very impressive, doesn't reflect profitability because most of the most lucrative types of freight weigh the smallest amount. And that's where American railways have sort of, in my opinion, diluted themselves into a degree of success. And that yes, they've got fairly high ton miles, which works out to, when you calculate by ton miles for inner city freight, last time I checked, it's in the 38% of ton miles. But the tons don't tell you about all the local traffic they weren't counting. And it does not talk to you about light shipments, intermodal shipments, electronics, whatever you like, U.S. mail, that's not heavy, that's moving on freight, which is generally warrants more money to get it over the road quicker, if, if that makes any sense. Um, Italy, the amount of freight it was alarmingly low. I think it was about 5%, 5 to 6%, and that's uh, like a 2015 figure. Um, the passenger figures were they, I'm going to say in the 20%, just guessing. I, I looked at the, the numbers yesterday, but I don't have them in front of me. So it, they don't have anywhere near the market share that you might hope. Um, they probably have a vastly better market share here. I think rail in the United States is in the 1% range. It's, it's pretty low. Um, again, around a big city such as New York or Philly, it's higher. In Wyoming, it's negligible. Um, one of the unfair comparisons that American railways often suffer is people will say, well, we don't have the density to justify railways. Well, we do in the big city areas. So anywhere from Portland, Maine through Southern Virginia is comparable to a lot of Europe as far as population density. I did a comparison for an article in Trains Magazine where I compared New Jersey to Belgium and Belgium being one of the most densely populated countries in Europe. And the two have a very similar population density. Uh, New Jersey has decent passenger service by American standards, but it's not a patch on what the Belgians have. So the argument in my mind is if that's the argument you're using, it was invalid from the get-go. 
Um, could we do better here as far as market share? I think we could. One of the things that the big railroads have basically forsaken is short distance, high value traffic. Um, they either cannot figure out how to do it or cannot figure out how to do it economically within the uh, infrastructure that we presently have. So they focus high volume traffic on manageable infrastructure. So single track main lines, maybe sections of double track, very long distances. Um, the distances in Europe are nowhere near as long between point of delivery from point of collection. So you could argue if they could do it there, we could probably do it here as well. Um, it would require an awful lot of planning and re-education of the way we run railways. Um, and that's, that could take, you could write a book on that. Um, you know, changing the way you look at railways and changing the way you operate railways will change how you address the different markets. Um, there's plenty of examples in Europe of very short distance, but lucrative freight moving over a railway, usually in situations where it suits the customer. For example, in Ireland, they have what they call a Terra Mines train. The Terra Mine is a zinc mine about 30 miles from Dublin, three or four times a day. A train makes a circuit from the zinc mine to the port of Dublin. Why? Because the local communities don't want there to be a continual parade of trucks through their towns. And the railway was the simplest way to serve the mine. Um, there's no reason why we couldn't do similar things like that here. We would have to work out the infrastructure. Um, I'm going to give you the short version of a long story. Ed Burkhart used to operate Wisconsin Central. Um, in the 1990s, he was traveling with one of his marketing managers on a train. And he noticed going northbound out of Chicago that they passed several quarries, aggregate quarries and pro aggregate processing facilities, for the lack of a better word, and asked his manager why these companies weren't shipping by rail. The manager didn't know. And he says, well, find out. And the short version is, is that they bought some secondhand gypsum cars from Canadian National and they worked out a favorable crewing arrangement. And within a couple of years, they had a single locomotive handling short trains where they'd gather crushed aggregate from various points on the line and deliver it to where it needed to be. And this was a new traffic on the railway. Uh, fast forward several years and uh, Canadian National took over Wisconsin Central and the management then under uh, Hunter Harrison didn't understand why they were wasting track capacity with low volume aggregate and uh, the business no longer was handled by railways after a while. The details of which you can kind of connect the dots, I don't really know. Ed himself told me a version of that story. Um, the point is, if you want the traffic and you can find a way to handle it, it can be done. He did that on a single track railway with more or less existing infrastructure. One of the problems that we faced in this country is because there's limited track space and the way we run trains, the way we run trains reflects the type of traffic we carry. So to try to all of a sudden just turn around and start trying to do something different with the existing infrastructure would cause more problems than good. Um, if you notice the type of infrastructure in Europe where you have multiple track main lines, we have you know, passing, you know, passing sidings with high speed, that's a bad word, switches that allow the train to enter the siding at a greater speed. Um, I don't like to use the word high speed because it's nebulous. Um, a lot of what we call high speed rail in America would not be even considered high speed in Europe. Unfortunately for the United States, largely perpetuated by the mass media, we tend to use high speed as a synonym for intercity. Uh, so anytime a service is planned between cities, it's a high speed service, regardless of top operating speed. As I pointed out in a different article in Trains Magazine, when it comes to speed, overall average speed is actually of greater relevance to the person traveling than the top operating speed. Today on the Northeast Corridor, there's places where Amtrak's Acela Express can travel at 150 miles an hour. There are places that coming soon, they'll be able to operate at a top speed of 165 miles an hour. The actual average speed between Washington and Boston isn't even half of that. So where you can sometimes achieve the greatest gain is not by increasing the top operating speed, but by fixing junctions and reducing places where the train is plodding along coming out of a station or having to go through a crossover where it might have to drop to 25 miles an hour to get through a set of crossovers. A train that was traveling at 150 miles an hour, if it has to reduce to 25 miles an hour before it can go back up to 150, 
wouldn't it be better just to operate the train at 90 miles an hour consistently? You'd probably find that you do so for a lot less money and actually have a better over the road time. And you'd have a more flexible railway because you'd have a crossover that allowed you to get a train through it more quickly. Steve, I've got a, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm asking a question from Steve uh, Sondheim. Uh, generally, how is this infrastructure, this high performance infrastructure in Europe funded? Who makes um, the decisions? That I really don't, I can't answer that authoritatively. It's, it's funded through the national governments and through the EU. Um, it's largely, you know, it's largely, it's not private. Now, there are third party operators that may be private companies, but the infrastructure itself would be handled similar, I would assume, to the way we handle highways here. Um, and this is something that I don't really get, is why we view today rail infrastructure distinct from highway infrastructure. Now, historically, railways here were built privately. I understand that. But there's no fundamental difference between rail infrastructure and highway infrastructure in terms of what it does. There's no reason we could not have federally sponsored infrastructure. And one of the things that's missing in the United States that's less missing in Europe is most of our route network, the routes, the, 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 not the railway lines themselves, not the track, but the routes themselves, dates back to planning exercises from the 19th century. Often an entrepreneur decided that we were gonna connect this small town with that small town for whatever traffic they were going after and then lines expanded and were connected. Um, what is missing today are better engineered, more direct routes that serve today's traffic. That's, that's what's missing out, outside of the Northeast and even within the Northeast. I just pointed out in another article in Trains, you cannot run a freight train directly from Washington, Philadelphia through New York City to New England. There's no way to do it. Historically, the cars were floated across New York Harbor, but that operation largely ended with the coming of Penn Central. It had been in decline for years. In 1910, the New Haven Railroad floated 2,000 freight cars a day for interchange across New York Harbor. So there was a through freight service. In addition to that, there was a bridge at Poughkeepsie. Today, it's a walkway that allowed you to run a freight train out of New England to the West. Um, that's just one example of where the infrastructure does not allow you to do something that would be very useful for a lot of people if you could have a through freight service. We have a through passenger route, but we do not have a through freight route. And you ask why not run freight trains on the passenger route? Well, there's a lot of good reasons for that. One, the passenger, the grades of the passenger line would not suit most modern freight trains. The clearances on the passenger route would not suit most modern freight cars. And if a freight train broke down beneath the Hudson River and delayed all the commuter trains coming into New York, that would probably pose a greater disadvantage than an advantage. Pennsylvania Railroad had investigated building a, a freight tunnel under New York Harbor um, in the World War I period, but it never got past the planning stage. I've got a, a question from George Hockless, um, and it, it's very short. And I already know the answer, but he asks, can advanced railway signaling help to ease the FRA's requirement for ridiculous buffer strength on US passenger equipment? Uh, in Europe, I'm sure that the, the safety standards for constructing passenger cars are... Um, well, in they, Germany, I don't speak for all of Europe, but in Germany, the philosophy is, you know, keep the train from crashing. In America, the philosophy is, is make sure that the equipment can survive a crash. I think the correct answer is somewhere in the middle. Um, we have a very different philosophy on crash worthiness here. We also have kind of, a, in a lot of ways, kind of a slipshot way of operating some of our, our main lines. Um, we do things here that would never be allowed in Europe. Um, for example, in, in most of England and Ireland, you cannot run a passenger train on a line that does not have signals. We do that here all the time. There are several lines where there are no signals at all. The trains are controlled. All the movements are carefully controlled, but there is no signal. And even today, there's plenty of places where there's no, there's no positive train control. I am not necessarily a proponent of positive train control for a variety of reasons. I think that they picked a bad way of doing something they could have done a lot more cheaply that would have accomplished 98% of what they wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, they decided to reinvent the wheel and they cho chose an oval one instead of a round one. That's my opinion, but um, I know I'm probably not popular for saying that. 
Uh, I wrote another quick question. Howard Stein asked um, about the catenary voltages in Europe where we saw uh, local trams operating on uh, main lines. Are the voltages? The voltages vary everything from 600 volts DC to 25,000 volts AC, various frequencies, various me methods of transmission. The advent of modern high voltage electronics in the form of thyristors and gate turnoff switches um, has uh, allowed you to create uh, a locomotive or a propulsion equipment that can adapt uh, without any human intervention from one type of electrification to another. One of the things that with a lot of those modern locomotives such as the Siemens Vectron is you can order one that's two, three, four different voltages that automatically detects what kind of voltage. So the change in voltage is not as much of an issue that it would have been in years past. It used to be you'd either have to buy a very expensive multi-voltage lo multi locomotive or you'd have to change engines where the electrification changed. Um, that's much less true now. Um, more to the point is the signaling. The signaling is actually a bigger problem and they've been working towards introducing standardized signaling, certainly on primary international corridors. Um, different variations of cab signaling can require an awful lot of very complicated equipment. Uh, we probably just need to wrap up with this last question that was submitted by Rich Rosenthal, who's a, a rail passenger uh, at large council member. Uh, he prefaces his question with uh, U.S. rail patrons and the general public, along with lawmakers, have long questioned why American passenger trains cannot be on par with the countries that you've just described. And while freight and, and passenger scheduling uh, is contentious uh, and indeed is a major contributor to uh, poor marketing uh, and selling of passenger service, uh, in general, what, what systematic improvements uh, could we take from the Europeans that could be made in the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, improving passengers? I, I don't know if I would agree with a lot of what he said. I think that there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions there. Um, freight scheduling isn't necessarily incompatible with passenger scheduling. Freight operations have different requirements, especially here. Um, we like to run freight trains. When I say we, I mean the freight railroads like to run freight trains when it suits them. Um, in theory, precision schedule railroading is supposed to get around that. In practice, it does something quite the opposite. Um, you can run freight trains on a schedule. The Europeans do so. They don't generally run their freight trains as fast as their passenger trains. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of different ways you can get around that problem. Probably the is to have people who understand railway infrastructure and signaling systems most economically provide new and improved infrastructure and then plan 25 year, 50 year plan of what you want to do, how you want to accomplish it, how you want to accomplish it and how to get the best value yet so you don't waste money where it could be best applied. And that's something I can throw money at the problem and build infrastructure and then not have any money for operations. That isn't necessarily the infrastructure that you need. So where can you best spend the money in a five year, a 10 year, a 25 year and a 50 year plan for what you're spending? And that takes a lot of thought. One of the difficulties we sometimes get into, if you're going to operate truly high speed trains at 150 miles an hour or faster, you want separate infrastructure. If you just want to run faster trains on existing infrastructure, you'd be better to build more track. It maybe do like they do there where you have 125 mile an hour tracks along 90 mile an hour tracks. You can run your freight trains on the 90 mile an hour track at 60 passenger trains on the 125 mile an hour tracks. If you need to repair the 90 mile an hour tracks, you can detour the freight trains onto the 125 mile an hour tracks to make good use of your infrastructure. Duplicating your infrastructure without any flexibility between the two, you've squandered your resources. I can't put it more simply. If you really want to build a better railway, truly separate it out and build the 150 mile an hour railway but build it 150 mile an hour from the time it leaves the home terminal to the orders in 
every so many miles because then you're not going to have a 150 mile an hour railway. Realistically, most of what we want does not to need to be that fast. If we would operate trains at a consistent 90 or 100 miles an hour and kept them at those speeds using a lot of existing rights of way, we could probably, for the money spent, get a lot more useful system in the short term and then look towards gradually working towards high speed. If you look at what they did in Japan, the original to augment the already saturated double track narrow gauge main line. Line, because they already had saturation density freight and passenger traffic. So they built a line, Shin meaning new, Shinkansen new railway adjacent to the old railway to provide greater capacity and greater speed. In France, they had a different philosophy altogether where they wanted, because of the nature of the French population distribution, you had Paris and then outlying cities with not much in between. So they built very high speed lines to get you from Paris as quickly as possible to the countryside, to where these other cities were. They did not waste a lot of money building high speed lines through the center of Paris. The railways that were there were improved but so you use the existing railway to get the train out of the terminal. And then once it gets into the countryside, gets on the high speed line, the LGV, if you like, to get you at 106, 186 miles an hour or 202 miles an hour, depending on where you are, it gets you down the country quickly, right? In other words, it gets you to where you wanna be. They've gradually implemented a strategy to build more of these high speed lines over a span of more than 40 years. It didn't all happen at once. They started with the route to Marseille and they've gradually been connecting other points across France. Different philosophy. Uh, the Italians who invented high-speed rail in the World War I era had what they call the Deratissima, which is a very highly engineered, largely level line that uses a lot of tunnels to get through the difficult Italian infrastructure or different Italian geography with, modern, with infrastructure. Originally, the Deratissima was designed for both freight and passenger. A low-grade line is very good for freight trains. It's also very good for high-speed passenger trains. So there's a variety of different approaches. Um, one as before is we need to look at where we want to go literally from A to B and connect the get connect the dots in ways that we didn't connect them before. So the and for passenger is more useful. That doesn't mean abandoning old lines. It means augmenting the lines that we have with new lines. Ryan, I'm afraid we're gonna to have to cut this off. I could listen to you all day and I know more of us on this call, on this webinar could as well. Uh, this has been extraordinary. And we thank you very, very much for the photography, your, your knowledge and everything that uh, you've brought to this. It has inspired a very lively chat exchange while you were talking, I might add. Uh, many people sharing views and um, and asking questions and many responses uh, from others. So uh, you've definitely caught people's interest. Uh, and um, as I say, I wish we could go on with this. It's really well. I'm, I'm very happy that um, I've had the opportunity to speak to you. And if I could just insert an advertisement up here, we have it's not a high speed railway, but nice journey. Um, and uh, we're trying to make it a pleasant experience for people. Um, our top speed has just been raised from 20 to 25. So uh, we're, we're <laughs> well, purposes, not to get you there, but to give you a good experience. So Yeah, and that's part of the pleasure, you know, of train travel. It's just the experience of getting there. So, but thank you again so much. And we will be posting uh, a recording of your webinar on the uh, Virginia Rail Policy Institute website. Uh, and uh, I will send out an announcement so people know it's there and it'll be there for eternity. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Send me the link. Um, I've got to go because I've got to get back to work and I've got to get some lunch. So I appreciate everyone for tuning in. I, I hope I, what I said makes sense. Um, there's an awful lot of information behind everything I've said. So um, I would- It really is. <laughs> as much as they can. Thank you. Um, thank you. And, and Meredith, I would like to add, um, one brief thing, um, VHSR has an upcoming town hall um, and we, our featured speaker is Mr. Bozy, uh, President Biden's acting FRA administrator.
um, pending Senate approval, and that's on June 15th at 1 p.m. Um, it's a free webinar as well, so I hope uh, everyone uh, on this uh, will is interested, will participate. Uh, and thank you again, Brian and, and VRPI for a great program. Thank you, Danny, for your help with the technology. We really appreciate the collaboration, the many collaborations we have with Virginians for High-Speed Rail. Goodbye.